So, so when you hear about these words, and, 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 and what I was basically saying is, is that this is an old hymn. And don't worry, Pastor Mark, we don't do hymns and things like that all the time in here. But what I wanted you all to really hear about is we want to have a mix between the old, the new, and the super new, the bleeding edge new. But I, what I wanted, to hear, wanted you to hear was just the words. It says, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. In other words, this is where you're actually coming to the garden of God, or this is when you go to your secret place with him. And then the word, or then Jesus begin to disclose particular things in your ear. You know, just as we were teaching our marriage class this morning, is that it's good for a man and a woman to be able to speak sweet nothings into your ear. Well, in this particular case, Jesus is actually speaking sweet some things speaking life into your ear and then those the, the 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 refrain goes on it says and he walks with me you know that's the title of this morning's message and he walks or jesus walks and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own just imagine you walking with jesus and then he talks with me and then he walks with me and then this a man called Jesus, which is the embodiment of God, the creator of all heaven and earth, tells me that I am his own. And the joy that we are sharing with one another as we tarry or as we wait there in prayer, in communion with each other, none other has ever known. In other words, that is a, 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 a picture of intimacy, true intimacy. Just as a man and woman, uh, when they are married, begin to make love with each other and they begin to uh, speak uh, 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 sweet things to each other, that is an intimate moment. Hallelujah. Just as it is in the natural, so it is in the spirit when Jesus Christ actually begins to let you know that all that I created, everything that you see around here that is living, and I have created you, I want you to know that you are mine. Just as the psalmist Marvin Sapp basically says, I am his, and uh, or, or he is mine, and I am his. It doesn't matter what the wrong I did. God only sees me for who I am. Everybody see he is mine. It, it basically lets you know that uh, God is ours and we are his. None other has ever known. In other words, I don't know what you've been through. I can't speak for you, but I know what God has done for me. I know the, jo the, the journey that he has taken with me, and he has walked with me. And in those dark and, and those uh, dreary nights when I didn't know what was going to happen, I know that he talked with me. And when everyone else forsaken me, and when all my friends turned up, uh, my, their backs on me and, and things of that nature, I, he, out of the midst of all of the noise, he told me that I was his own. Hallelujah. Now, there's something to wonder when you know that the God of all heaven and earth 
wrapped himself up into our flesh just to give you a message to let you know that, guess what? I have your back. Hallelujah. The, the, the psalmist also goes on to say he speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing. Can you picture this? And the melody he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And in other words, uh, uh, he begins to speak to you, not just with audible words, but he begins to speak to your hearts in dreams and in visions. And it begins to lift you up so high. And it's like the natural high. You thought that you had one high out in the world. But when you get high on Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, then all of a sudden your heart begins ringing because it's kind of like you finding out who your daddy is. You know, Maury Povich has his show basically saying, well, who is the father or who is the real father? Even this morning, I was telling my wife when I was looking out at the trees, I actually saw a matrix of a genome or an actual gene, which is actually what is made up or the actual outlay of a human body. And that's, that began to let me know. I was like, wow, I see a little bit of God's DNA in his creation. And being that I see uh, God's DNA, remember as I said last week, which is deoxyribonucleic acid, just as I saw this nice little DNA structure inside of the trees, I was like, what, what, what more <laughs> can he see in us? The Father. There is a DNA match. I know who my Father is because he speaks to my heart. A, a, when, a, when a woman has a child, that child could go off into a far land. But when that child comes back in the midst of all those children, that, that that child begins to cry out, then that mother will be able to hear their child. Well, just as that mother can hear their child, so God also hears his child, even though they may go afar off. When they begin to cry out to him in their dreams, in their visions, and in their hearts, he begins to hear them. And then he begins to talk with them and walk with them and tell them that he is their own. Now watch this. I'd stay in the garden with him through the night around me be falling. In other words, even though uh, everything around me is crashing down and all these things are happening, yet and still we have created a, a, a temporary garden of Eden in prayer, which is what God originally wanted. That place is where God began to speak to Adam and speak uh, uh, sweet things in his ear to let him know that he was the, the man that, that let him know the Eve that, that she was the woman and they were supposed to populate the entire earth. They were to commune with each other. They had no clothes. In other words, that's a picture of transparency in that garden. Hallelujah. But knowing that we are in the state of the world that we are in, he says that it is time to go that you must leave this garden, this time of prayer, because we are not in heaven yet. We have to let, we have to know that this is a temporary situation. And although our prayer with him is not uh, 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 something that we could stay in forever, he says that we should pray always, seeking him, petitioning him. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. In other words, he's sad when you get from out of his presence. And he longs for you to get back into his presence because when you were, uh, before you entered into your mother's womb, you were with him always. And so it's like him missing you. Can you imagine that? God misses me? But I thought that he was everywhere and here all at the same time. Well, yes, God does miss you. He misses the time that you were with him in spirit before you entered into your mother's womb. When you used to lay there in his bosom, when he used to rock you back and forth and just speak to you. After all, <laughs> you are his child. And then even though you may come through this life and you learn all of these weird and, w and evil and wicked things, the day that you recognize that he is your father, with open arms he gives you the ring and the fatted calf, and he opens up his arms and he lets you know, hey, I'm ready to embrace you again, and I will never bring up anything that you have done in your past. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. This morning, scripture is going to come from out of Isaiah chapter 53, and this is going to be in the message translation. You will see this on your screen. Hallelujah. You will see this on your screen. Hallelujah. Now watch this, and I promise to you that I won't be before you long. This is what you would call the essence or the, the picture of Jesus. Let's see what the prophet Isaiah is foretelling about this one called Jesus who believes what we've heard and seen who would have thought God's saving power would look like this 
God's saving power. The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. After all, he was just a man. Verse 3 says, he, look, he was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him, though he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it on himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. We're talking about the cross, the passion of the Christ. If you ever want to see what Isaiah 53 is all about, watch the passion of the Christ that Mel Gibson had. Just sit down with someone and just watch that movie, and you'll see what Pastor Martin is talking about in, the, in a vivid, cinematic way. Verse 5 says, but it was our sins that did that to him, that actually put him on the cross that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. He took the punishment, and in that punishment, his punishment made us whole. Through his bruises, we get healed. We are all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way. And God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong on him, on him. Verse 7 says, he was beaten, he was tortured, but he didn't say a word. Like a lamb taken to the slaughter, I feel the Holy Spirit right there, and like a sheep being sheared, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried, and he was led off, and did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought of his own welfare, beaten, bloodied for the sins of my people, all of you around this community and in this sanctuary. They buried him with the wicked. They threw him in a grave with a rich man, even though he never hurt a soul or said one word that wasn't true. He was innocent, blameless, guiltless. Verse 10 says, still it's what God had in mind all along, to crush him with pain. The plan was that he give himself as an offering for sin so that he'd see life come from it. Life, life, and more life. And God's plan will deeply prosper through him. Out of that terrible travail of the soul, which is basically him being and dying and crucified on the cross, he'll see that it's worth it. And be glad that he did it. Through what he experienced, my righteous one, my servant will make many righteous ones. I'm going to say that again. Through what he experienced on the cross, my righteous one, my sinless son Jesus, my servant, will make many righteous ones. You and I sitting in these pews as he himself carries the burden of their sins. Therefore, I will reward him extravagantly the best of everything, the highest honors, because he looked death in the face and didn't flinch. I like that. Because he embraced the company of the lowest, he took on his own shoulders the sin of many, he took of the cause of all the black sheep. This, in essence, is what you would call an expository scripture. In other words, this is where the Bible will preach itself. This is where the Bible will lay out the case itself, exactly what Jesus is doing. Now, in this particular season that we call resurrection, I will call this a resurrection month, where we actually lead up until the time of Easter or the time of Resurrection Sunday. I wanted to give you a picture of how Jesus Walk. And once again, the title of this morning's scripture is Jesus Walk. Your life saved my life, part two. Amen. God, show me the way because the devil's trying to break me down. Amen. 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 
Jesus walk, your life, God, your son's life, saved my life. Jesus' life saved my life. And now that I know about him and I know of him, I want to have more of an intimate relationship with him because in order to really find out what is going on in a man's mind, you need to step in his shoes. Isn't it wonderful to know that sometimes when we're inside of the church world, uh, you have a lot of judgmental and self-righteous type of people that look down their uh, pious noses at people, letting them know, or making them feel as if they're worthless or not uh, churched enough. Well, Jesus did the actual opposite of that. He actually was in full uh, 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 combat with the church at this moment in time. The religious system. He brought in revelation rather than in religion, which is restrictive. For the Bible says that the, 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 the letter killeth, but the spirit make it alive. In order to find out where a man has, has, has come from, in order where, to find out where a man is going, it would be nice to just walk in the shoes that he walked. So I submit to you this morning that this, this, this whole series that I'm talking about is letting you know the, the very inception of how he was doing miracles, signs, and wonders inside of the earth realm. And as he began to walk and doing all those good things behind the scenes, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, as well as uh, Judas were all conspiring together. You know, those three, the, 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 the an unholy trinity, the Antichrist spirit within themselves was all conspiring to destroy this man called Jesus. And on a deeper and a revelatory sense, it's actually the church trying to destroy who God and what God's original intent for man is supposed to be. That seems like an oxymoron, doesn't it, where you have the church, which is supposed to be all about God, that's all up, supposed to be all about the agenda of God, that's supposed to be in the image and likeness of God, but they are all intent on pushing out God. That doesn't make any sense, but yet and still, when we look all around the landscape of the United States, even around the world, we see that the church is trying to push out God and bringing in this false doctrine, this false religious type of atmosphere, this false uh, 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 antichrist spirit that is all standing up themselves, standing up within the house of the Lord. But the good news is, is that Jesus said that all these things that will come, there will be false teachers, false prophets, them, uh, people saying, Lord, Lord, but, and, and, and saying uh, all of these wonderful things, but yet their heart is far from him. But there is a remnant of people inside of this earth realm that will preach the cross and will teach everyone how Jesus' life saved your life. This message of the cross is an unpopular message when you have cars, money, houses, and land, the bling that you would spin around your neck and all these type of things. All of those things are fine, well, and good, but that won't get you to heaven. For the Bible says that do not lay up treasures for yourself on this earth, but up in heaven. How do you do that? By loving God more than you love yourself. By treating your neighbor as you would treat yourself. With loving the Lord thy God with all your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. Those are the two greatest commandments that Jesus talked about. How can you love a God that you uh, can't see and, or how can you love a God that you cannot see and do not love your brother that you can see? If you're saying that you're doing those things, then God says in his word that you are nothing but a liar and the truth is not in you. You have to love the God that you can't see and you must also love the, the person that you can see. Because if Christ be in you, which is the hope of glory, then you should be able to emit his image and likeness to those that are around you. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I want to shine in dark places. Now we begin to transition from the Passover. Last week we talked about the Passover lamb and how Jesus was sitting there knowing that he was being conspired against by the church, the synagogues, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, as well as Judas. They were all sitting at the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. They're all sitting there. It's kind of like you going to Barn Hills or, or going to Red Lobster and you sitting at a table with your closest friends. All in your mind, you know that you're getting ready to die in a couple of days. Or you're getting ready to go off to war, go off to the military to fight one of the worst, most treacherous battles ever. You're in special forces, and you're sitting with your entire crew right down there at Red Lobster. You're the leader, and all of your followers are sitting there battling with each other, talking about who 
Whose turn is it to wash the feet first? So what the leader does is that he gets out. This Jesus gets up from his table and he begins to wash each one of his disciples' feet in all humility and in all grace. And now we come up to the point now where they've gotten up from the table and now they are all proceeding towards this garden called Gethsemane. All the disciples are now aware that Jesus is getting ready to die. For he has said over and over in his words that the Son of Man is about to be given up to be crucified. In Jesus' name. We know that the Son of Man is getting ready to have all of these things happen to him. Just imagine you find out tonight that you're getting ready to die tomorrow. How would you act? And those of you that have friends that are very, very close to you, how would they act? If they really care for you, then wouldn't they have some of the same characteristics that you do? I would submit to you, yes. This is where we would come to the picture of the midnight time in the Garden of Gethsemane. Notice the prevailing theme over and over again that the song that I sung to you was about being in the garden and how we are to have a temporary Garden of Eden in the places that we dwell because that is what God originally intended. Well, likewise, Jesus and his disciples were getting ready to go up to the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you not realize or do you not not know that the Garden of Gethsemane was a place that was full of olive trees? Even to this day, if all of us were to take a trip to the land of Israel, there there are are, are, are olive trees that are over 2,000 years old. And all of those olive trees have olives on them. Do you not realize also that olives are what was used for the anointing? That when they are pressed and when they are crushed, there's oil that comes from out of them. Well, this particular garden is where Jesus was walking along with his disciples. They had mixed emotions at this time. There was pain. There was sorrow. There was anguish. But yet there was an unfettered and unflinching determination. Not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. Christ was determined to pray Through this particular situation, although his body was weary from sleep deprivation and extreme sorrow, while he was in this particular garden of Gethsemane, just picture, it's nighttime. There's all these big, huge, twisted trees with all of these olives on them. A beautiful garden, the night sky, everything is clear. You see all the stars, you see the the moon, and you have this group of 12 around you, even Judas Iscariot. It's a wonder that the scripture says God has presented a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, he wants you to eat despite the trouble that is getting ready to come. And I'm picking a dark and grim picture of this because, once again, if has anyone ever threatened you with your life and letting you know that by this time tomorrow you will be dead and you didn't do anything wrong. It's kind of like, as I illustrated last week, you being executed for a sin that you did not commit. Your fingerprints are nowhere near the scene. After all, you were in Daytona Beach somewhere when the crime transpired here in Orlando. But yet the police pick you up and they take you and they put you inside of jail and they get ready to inject the concoction or 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 the cocktail of different types of drugs into your veins and all the while you know that you are innocent. Oh, what type of sorrow would that be? But yet during this point in time, this restless night, Jesus was sitting there uh, 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 with all power still in his hand. But he was still a man. That should let you know that he can relate with you when you go through those pressures or those times of life. But this is an extraordinary amount of pressure to know that I am innocent. I did not do anything wrong, but yet I must die for those that really don't deserve it. But I know that it is necessary. And while I'm in the midst of this particular turmoil within my spirit, I begin to pray in this garden called Gethsemane. We should always watch and pray because after all, he was telling the disciples at this time that you need to watch and pray. Watch and pray. Jesus himself often withdrew into the wilderness to pray. This is what you would call the wilderness experience. You know the wilderness when you go out there into a mist of a dry land. If you were to go and to stop on the side of a road where there's John Young Parkway or even in Sanford, they have all these particular cow patches and you could just walk out there and there's no one out there except for you alone. Just imagine that, that Jesus was going out here into the midst of this wilderness type of situation to pray, not to call on anyone, 
not to cry or anything like that, but to pray for strength. This scene also depicts the stark contrast between the joys and triumphs of past miracles, signs and wonders, and the deep despair of sorrow for the mission to come. After all, he was healing the, the lame. He was giving sight to the blind. He was raising the dead up from out of the dry places. After all, he, uh, Lazarus was bound and he was in the, the tomb for, for four days. And then Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. After all these things, he walked on water and now he's getting ready to die. You talk about a mix of emotions. You talk about a stark contrast. You talk about a paradoxical type of situation. But yet and still, Jesus, in the midst of these mixed emotions, he sat down and he pray. You talk about a conflict, an eternal conflict, the battlefield of the mind. There are several themes to observe here. Number one, doing God's will. The next is submission, sorrow as well as affliction, and then also the priority of prayer. Matthew chapter 26 verses 36 through 42 says this, then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. Remind you that this is the time when they got up from the Lord's Supper. You know the picture once again in the back of Grandmama's house that's sitting up there right above the coffee table or right in the living room with Jesus and all of his 12 disciples as well as Judas. They just got up from there and they're now walking into the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples are sick to their stomach. They are full of despair. Despair. They saw all of these wonderful things. They followed this man. They've let and they've laid down all that they've known. They've walked off of their jobs, all trusting this man, and they've seen the pureness of God inside of him. And now they are aware of him dying. Mixed emotions, a stark contrast from what has happened before. Verse 36 says, then Jesus went with them to the Gold Grove called Gethsemane, and he sat there, and he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther into that same garden and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want all of your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. That is a point right there, that even though Sometimes you may be going through the most deepest and darkest point in your life. Sometimes even your closest friends will go to sleep on you. And they will not be able to relate with the pain that you are going through in your life. But Jesus knows because he was touched with all the same infirmities that we were touched with in ourselves. All of our mix of emotions. Verse 40 says, then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, could you not watch with me even one hour? Couldn't you relate or be able to join with me in my pain for even one hour? Couldn't those of you that are listening in the midst of this section where could not even empathize with Jesus only but for one hour? that we are preaching this morning. I understand that you have a lot going on today. I understand that, that as soon as the clock hits 12, your stomach will begin to rumble and you start thinking about KFC, pizza, hungry hours. I understand all of that. Could you not watch and listen only but for one hour? This tremendous amount of pain that I'm getting ready to go through with for you, couldn't you just stand with me for one hour? Verse 4 to 1 says, keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation or despair. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. We are willing to come to church, but our body is weak in order for us to follow up with the changes that happen as a result of being in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Verse 42 says, then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, Your will be done. In other words, Father, let the cup of this crucifixion 
this pain, this torment, these problems, these unreliable, these unrepentant, these evil people, let all of these sins pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, Lord, because that is what my flesh is saying, but my spirit is saying, thy will be done. In other words, I got to do what I got to do because my self-interests are not more important than the lives of those that are around me, past, present, and the future time in 2011 on this day in April. I have to die for them. They don't know any better, but I know better. And although I may be going through this pain, although I may end up with scars, just as the scars that, that Denzel Washington had on his back during the movie called Glory, just as I know that I'm going to have something that is worse than that, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Hallelujah. Christ had business in the garden, if I were to simply put it, that was more important than sleep. And nothing would deter him from praying to his father. Can you imagine all of those things, all of those emotions? And in the midst of that, you begin to pray. How many of us, when we have come to the midnight of our situations, have gotten down on our knees and have humbled ourselves up under the pressures of this life and now going to God? Because after all, we have come to the end of our rope, the end of our uh, uh, things that we could do ourselves, and we now buckle up under the pressure of this thing that is called life, only to reach up our hands to heaven, saying, Father, let this cup pass from me. Have mercy on me. Nevertheless, I have to keep living not my will, but thy will be done. I have to get on this job. Not my will, but thy will be done. I have to get through this marriage situation. Not my will, but thy will be done. I need to uh, uh, get through this sick part of my life. Not my will, but thy will be done. I don't want to stay here with my family. Not my will, but thy will be done. I want to quit, but not my will, but your will be done. We also need to recognize that during Jesus' prayer that night in the garden, every sorrow that he had ever known seemed to assault him all at once. If I were to have a movie, and I'm getting ready to close, if I were to have a movie or someone uh, to have a, the cinema, cinema, cinem cinematic type of gift to be able to illustrate what was like for Jesus during that moment when he actually died. Not just him just putting his head down and giving up the ghost. No, I'm talking about the actual uh, picture of what was going on in the spirit. If I were to give this to you, I could just imagine Jesus looking up to his father and then all of a sudden there'd be a picture or a topographical type of view where it would go down into his iris, into the middle of his eye, down to his spirit. And then every single spin, the sin of rape, the sin of incest, the sin of sodomy, the sin of, 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 of death, the sin of dying, the sin of destruction, the sin of all of these evil things, all of those things he experiencing all at once every single murder every single child being molested every single pain every single hurt every single person that was cut in their necks every single person that was raped every single person that was uh, said something bad by their father or their mother over and over again throughout their life every single person that was tortured every certain single person that was decapitated could you imagine all those sins being impacted on him all at once the sorrow that he felt all at once. Just imagine his body and all of the sins of the entire world that they were to all be carried out. What would that look like in the spirit just to one man? Hallelujah. Never was so much sorrow emanating from the souls of one such individual. From Jesus, this example would show all of us how to handle affliction. Peter, James, and John fought depression with sleep, but Jesus fought it with prayer. The reason for Christ's agony was not the pain and scourging by the people, but by the full brunt of the wrath of God doing his, uh, due to the taking on of all of their sins. As the intensity of agony increases, so does the sense of Jesus' determination to do the will of the Father. Why am I going to die for people that don't deserve it? How many of you all that are listening to me this morning would die for someone that you do not know? How come many of us could raise our hand and say that we're going to do that? None of you. You wouldn't do that. But yet, Jesus did. He died for strangers. He died for people that don't even know him. He died for people that don't even believe for in him. But yet, he did it anyway. Hoping that his love 
of sacrifice would draw them to himself. Jesus' entire life was characterized by a constant, systematic, premeditated, voluntary pattern of submission to the will of his Father's will. This lifelong display of character was necessary for the redemption of his people. And as I conclude this morning, this period of Jesus' life in the Garden of Gethsemane is a picture of the same type of agony Adam and Eve felt when they disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden. Just picture that. The same agony that Jesus felt in this garden was the same type of agony that Adam and Eve felt when they were expelled from the garden. Hallelujah. And it is ironic on how even when Jesus was resurrected, he was resurrected in the middle of a garden. Hallelujah. You will get it in a moment. Both Adam and Jesus felt the wrath of God. But one had the ability to get past the flaming swords to return to the garden to restore all of mankind. Do you not realize that when Adam and Eve were expelled out of the garden because they wanted to do things their own way, that there was a flaming sword that was, that was going and, and moving in all directions, letting them know that you will never be able to enter back into this place with me again. For all of this particular time, no man will be able to get to God because God is holy. How could you even meet up to that particular standard? But now that we have Jesus Christ, and all because of what he did in the next garden, now we can enter back into that garden. Why? Well, watch this. Although, once again, Jesus and Adam felt the wrath of God, one had the ability to get past the flaming swords to return to the garden to restore all of mankind. Those same swords that were meant to keep man out now have been removed and placed in the mouth of Christ to circumcise our heart as well as our souls. Affliction is a reality, but contentment is as well. All of us are going to have affliction in our life. All of us are going to feel lonely. All of us are going to have problems. All of us are going to have issues. But after a while, Jesus became content. How did he become content? Because he put his priority in prayer in the midst of a very death-like situation. This was the preparation table of the lamb to be slaughtered. Do you not realize that while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, that that in the spirit symbolized the table that God was saying, I will now set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. That table is the table or a spiritual table where Jesus Christ, which is the Lamb of God, was getting ready to be slaughtered. Just as I was telling you last week, in old ancient and Jewish times, they used to take 250,000 lambs up to the temple. And it used to be about two or, or actually about 600 priests that would take knives and four lambs a minute, they would kill them. Four lambs a minute on the temple steps. And it would be a stream of blood for all, from all 250,000 of those lambs all at one time, streaming down the steps of that temple into the valley of Kidron, down into the brook, until the brook turned crimson red. That is a picture of what Jesus Christ was doing in the spirit by laying himself in the spirit in the garden of Gethsemane. He was being prepared to be slaughtered. His blood pouring out just as those lambs were pouring out. Those were innocent lambs. He was the innocent lamb of God. This was the preparation table of the lamb of God to be slaughtered in the form of betrayal, the scattering of his congregation, yet he was quiet in the face of injustice and finally ending his life in agony and shame in front of many who had no remorse. Nevertheless, I want to submit to you this morning that there is still good news. Even though this is a dark and dreary picture of a man that is getting ready to be murdered by treacherous people, it seems as if at the end of this movie that evil wins. But there is good news and so as we begin to describe next week, what we're going to talk about is as what was the agony? What was the nature of the betrayal? How Jesus had the strength to be quiet in the face of this injustice. You will get a picture of all of that. Amen. And what that lesson is in that is to let you know that even though you have been betrayed, even though the people around you have been scattered, <laughs> even though uh, uh, you have seen or have been in some instances where your boss has told you to be quiet 
or your mom or dad have told you to be quiet or your spouse has told you to be quiet or somebody in your life has told you to be quiet and you feel like you have been uh, violated or that you have been put in a court where the, the public defender is not really standing up to you and standing up for you, I want to let you know that there is actually strength in that. You may have agony. You may have shame especially with those people that are your haters and don't like you and things like that. It always seems like for the moment they are winning. But I will let you know that there is good news. Hallelujah. Let us not only be hearers of the word, but also doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. This is what it's like when Jesus walks.